could be one or the other, or it could just simply be a cold. Now, we don't know. But I'm trying to stay away from everybody. I'll do this. So I don't want to uh, give it to anybody if it is a cold. <clears throat> For quite a few weeks here, we've been talking about the excuses that we hear over the years given by people who refuse to become children of God. And we're going to address some of those excuses again this morning. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you for having an answer to all the excuses people give who refuse to acknowledge your lordship and your sovereignty. We thank you for the gospel that is the power that you use for salvation and that we as your children need to share that gospel with others. And we know that there are many who will reject the teaching even after much teaching and pleading with them. But we pray, dear Lord, that those good and honest hearts that we come across who offer excuses for not becoming Christians are sincere and that the answers given will melt their hearts and turn them to Jesus for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus presented the cost of discipleship in John chapter 6 that Charlie just read, some of the people said it was just a little too much, that it required an entire devotion of one's life. And because they were not willing to make that sacrifice, the scripture says that many turned away and no longer followed Jesus. When Jesus saw this, he turned to the disciples and said, will you go away? You won't, will you? And Simon Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. And we know and believe that you are the Holy One come from God. They were totally convinced. I don't know what the excuses were given concerning those who refused to accept the Lordship of Jesus. But I'm sure a lot of it was... I just don't have what it takes to meet the demands of Jesus. And there are those that will say, I have too many things in my life that I need to correct before I make such a commitment. And I would simply say that Someone who is waiting to become a Christian until they have all their ducks in a row, until all their issues are cleared, cleared up, actually fail to understand that it is God who will help a person clear all that up. You know, I don't know. I would rather use a jack to raise a car off the ground to change a tire than to do it myself. It just makes more sense to have help to do something I can't do alone. And so for someone to say that, you know, I need to correct all this before I become a Christian, they're either saying that they don't want to correct it right now or they just fail to take into consideration 
and that God wants to help them to do that. In Philippians 4 and verse 13, I can do all things that, through Christ who strengthens me. Is that, is that just a cliche or did Paul actually believe that? He lived it. And he is a living example of one who believed that that was true. And you know what? He is not alone. There are myriad of Christians who, living and passed on, who have discovered that they could do things with Christ that they could not do alone. Breaking horrible habits. Are hard to break with your own strength. But with the strength of God through Christ Jesus, a Christian can overcome. If that's not the case, then isn't God to blame for asking us to do something we can't do? The thing that is necessary for every human being before he becomes a Christian is to repent. That is so clear that you need help to misunderstand it. John the Baptist came preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Jesus continued that. And he said this repentance will begin from Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when those people were convicted by the apostles of having crucified their Lord. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the first commandment out of Peter's mouth was repent. Some people fail to realize that in order to repent, you've got to do what the word means. And so often the word repentance is given the idea of conversion. The word repent is that you change the way you look at something. You change your mind. It's made up of two words. And those two words mean to change your thinking. And when you change the way you look at things, it's easier to handle those things that were not handled well before. When you get God's perspective of the things that are wrong, if you get Jesus' perspective of the things that are not right, it's easy to say, these things offend you, God, and I am not going to live this way any longer. And being a reproach before you and before us. So a person who says, I'm just not ready, I've got to correct a few things in my life, may be really telling more truth than they realize. They are not willing to pay the price. But you know, I always say that that is playing Russian roulette with a soul. You're just spinning the cylinder, you're cocking it and pulling the trigger with one bullet in that cylinder, and you just don't know when it's going to go off and kill you. Now, rejecting the Lord Jesus today may mean being rejected by him through eternity because we may die today. And so it's very important for us to take this very seriously. Coupled with this is the idea that somebody says, I'm too sinful. God would never forgive me for what I have done. Well, okay, let's just assume that the person has committed some atrocious sins over their lifetime and they just feel that they are beyond God's power to save. I'm sure there are people that have felt that way. And I'm sure there will always be people feeling that way. But let me just make a comment or two about this. There's an acknowledgement of a person's sinfulness that is commendable. There are others who just don't think that they are sinful and that they don't need Jesus, that their life is okay and they have no guilt about their lives or anything that they have done and they think that they're just fine and they don't need this religious business. 
However, those on the other hand who says, oh, I'm too sinful, at least admit the fact that all are sinful. And isn't it true that the sinfulness of our lives is relative to the holiness of God and not a comparison between me and somebody else? And so just eating a piece of fruit forbidden to God is worthy of death as a person who, like Cain, murdered his brother. Before the holy God of heaven, we're all too sinful to be forgiven on our own merit. But in John 3.16, that verse that you see a lot written on uh, placards in football games and so forth, you see out there, if you see a verse, it's usually this, or Philippians 4.13, I can do all things for Christ who strengthens me. But John 3.16, Martin Luther called it the gospel in miniature. God so loved the world that whoever, that includes the greatest sinner or the one who doesn't think he's that much of a sinner, that whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. Few remember what verse 17 says. For he did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. I'm going to give you a bi biography sketch of the Apostle Paul in just a moment. But I want to read the passage first, 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful appointed me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is truth-worthy. And deserving full acceptance, acceptance that Christ came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. I'm the chief of sinners, Paul said. And you know, considering what Paul is guilty of, I'd feel the same way if I was in his shoes. He held the cloaks of those a stone and innocent innocent man to death right in front of him. He held their cloaks, which means that he was the ringleader. And they did it in, uh, as a result of his encouragement. He would travel in distant places arresting Christians and drag them back to Jerusalem and force them to blaspheme. And he consented for their death. In a sense, he was a murderer of innocent people. He wrecked havoc upon the church and sought to destroy it. Acts chapter 8. And yet, he became a Christian and this verse that says that Christ came to the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost doesn't stop there. Read it. Look what he says. Be encouraged. I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. He's saying, you want to see the grace of God manifested upon a sinner? I'm the man. I was too sinful, but I was forgiven. But God is now using me as an example to others, to encourage others who feel the same way as I do about myself, to accept the grace of God and be forgiven and become a worker in the vineyard of the Lord. 
You know, in Mark 2 and verse 17, Jesus says, I did not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. Today we have actually focused upon those personal feelings about ourselves of being unworthy. I would have loved to have been raised in a Christian family. Had a father that taught me the Christian values that I sought to impart in my children. But I didn't. And I'm sure I am representative of many Christians in this world that committed a lot of sin before becoming a Christian. But let me tell you what a wonderful, wonderful relief it was to know that when I accepted the Lord, He forgave me all of my sins. And it made no difference had I been raised in a Christian family or a non-Christian family. My salvation is the same. It didn't matter what I did in the past. It matters what we do now. And some may say, well, I don't have it in me to be able to live up to those expectations. I've read the Sermon on the Mount, and he set the bar so high for everybody. I'm going to fail. He set up the bar for everybody to fail. Yes. And you know why? So that we would learn to not trust our own goodness, but in the love and grace of Jesus. He knows we're going to fail. And we're not going to be like the Pharisees who, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's of all the laws and put their thumbs underneath their armpits and say, look at me, I've done all these laws. Jesus says, no. The demands of being a Christian are high because it involves the heart and not just the physical action, not the physical things. Oh, yes, they are important, but the heart comes first. And we know when we're going to fail, but the important thing is that it will drive us to the mercy and love and forgiveness that are found by the grace of God and not by works. By grace are you saved, says Paul in Ephesians 2 and in verse 8, and not by works. It is not by the things that you do that you might boast in, but you're saved by grace through faith. And God will provide the means by which we will be victorious over our frailties. So don't let the future hinder us from beginning this new life. If you are here this morning and you have not been baptized upon the confession of your faith, the Lord does not accept any of your excuses. There are none that matter to God. They only matter to you. And all they do is to play in the hand of Satan, using those excuses to hold you back from making that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you not play into his wiles and his tricks? His bag of tricks is to provide you with many excuses for not serving the Lord. Don't buy into that. Be free from those fetters and realize it's a devil's trick to provide excuses for not serving the Lord. If you need to respond to heaven's call, do so as together we stand and as we sing.